Good morning, everyone. Welcome, Sergio, Ayala. We are so excited to have you um, on our uh, show today. Uh, would you tell us a little bit about your background and experience so we can get uh, everyone um, familiar with who you are and what you do? Sure. So um, thanks, uh, Rich and Doc, uh, for the invitation. Uh, so I appreciate your time, obviously. Um, so I've been in real estate for, uh, let's see, a little bit over 18 years, give or take. Um, started uh, mainly residential. I uh, went through the different facets of residential. For, uh, let's see, back in those days, I started with Cobo Banker. Uh, then, uh, you know, there are some agents who are gracious enough to offer me a kind of a shadow opportunity on them and, and learning the ropes. Uh, I started with Cobo Banker um, uh, on that side of uh, just mainly doing open houses for those agents and, you know, just the ministerial acts to get into the business. I was doing it part time at the time because I was working for uh, a tele telecom firm. I was working for Lucent Technologies back then. All right, thank you. Our audience uh, includes a lot of uh, traditional residential agents and lenders. Yes. And I realized that you manage a team that is, uh, includes a residential component. Right. Besides the obvious uh, d um, differences between the structure and purpose of the building, what are some of the key differences between residential and commercial agents? Sure. So. Uh, interesting question is people always think that you need two different licenses and you don't it's really the same real estate license uh you just kind of select which route you want to go and you specialize in the commercial world of course that comes along with uh all the things that you need to do in order to uh, be very proficient in the commercial world but on the residential side is you know how do you teach a residential agent uh how to you know, just understand the basics of a commercial transaction, understand uh, some of the, the basic questions that they can ask, or maybe some, uh, some key elements that they can see in a conversation in a, in a residential transaction that would kind of tip them off, you know what, there might be a commercial opportunity here. What are those, what are those skill sets that, that you think really lend themselves well to going the commercial track and when do you recognize that somebody is 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 probably better suited for that you know it's a you got to have that problem solver mentality right that that's pretty much it you're trying to solve a problem here or or provide a solution uh to a potential problem in here um it's really being open-minded being creative that's probably the number one key right here in commercial is being creative how is to structure a deal? You know, there's a thousand ways you can structure a commercial deal. You really have to be creative. You know, the difference on the residential world, obviously because of a lot of the red tape from the lending side and, you know, rest and some other uh, things in the, in the residential, there's only so much you can do uh, as far as getting creative and structuring the deal. In residential, you're not bound by the same, so you really can get a little bit more creative in how you you structure the deal and provide that solution to um, to your potential client or customer um, or or to the consumer, right? Because oftentimes the opportunities come because there's a need. There's a need by the consumer. There's a need by the uh, by the community. Uh, there's a product, and uh, you find a ways how to connect those two. You know, you might know some investors. They might not be involved in that particular business, but you you see there's a need. In a certain area, you connect these people and say, you know what, uh, you maybe have some financial resources, you have some connections. I think there's some opportunities over here on this community because this particular business is needed. And you try to merge or connect those two and again, be a problem solver. So I think that's probably the, the number one skill that you have to develop is listen more, talk less, and be a problem solver. Uh, Sergio, it, you recently made that transition to commercial agent, um, you know, six, seven years ago, I think you said. And the, the, the question I, I, I'm wondering is, if I'm an agent and I, uh, I have an interest in commercial, what steps should I take? Uh, what, what courses, et cetera, designations? How do you recommend making that transi transition and making it successful? 
So the, the easiest way for that transition would be uh, obviously try to either shadow or partner a commercial agent, right? So you start working with them, let them show you the ropes, maybe go on to some appointments, uh, listen to them on the phone, uh, just watch it on a daily basis. What are they doing? What are they doing? Researching on a computer, talking to people, uh, networking off, you know, activities. Um, that's the basic. And then, of course, you should, your CE classes, uh, you should start taking a lot of those courses or classes more focused on the commercial side. Um, so start searching around for uh, either the um, uh, the commercial uh, the commercial board, um, which is the Atlanta Commercial Board of Realtors, uh, or some other organizations that will offer commercial CE classes. Just briefly uh, on the theory that this is more or less an introduction to commercial real estate for our viewers, can you talk about briefly just the different asset types in commercial real estate? Sure. Um, that would be like the, the most basics will be like uh, retail, office, industrial, uh, I'll say multifamily, uh, mixed use land. Those are kind of pretty much the most basic ones or the general ones. And, and then in there you have also places of worship, uh, assisted living uh, or senior living facilities, hospitality, which hotels, of course, mostly uh, medical office buildings. We call it MOVs. Uh, self-storage, those are a little bit more specific. Mm -hmm. um, but again, retail, office, industrial, multifamily, uh, land, and I would say mixed use. And mixed use... Of all those different types of commercial real estate, uh, do you work in all of them uh, or focus on specific asset types? So I, I focus on, on specific types, and this is something that you'll learn pretty quickly in the commercial world that you cannot be a, um, a master of all the trades, right? Uh, you have to uh, pick a niche, find a niche. Um, and usually for a lot of the agents uh, transitioning into the commercial world, and by the way, there's a, there's an, I, could, I guess a, a word that was kind of made up um, for people transitioning. It's called the, we call it resumercial or resumercial. And it's a lot of that, you know, residential transitioning agent into the commercial world. For the residential um, people, I, I think they should also uh, find a niche themselves. And, and how do you find a niche? Well, the easiest way is, what's my background, right? What's my previous life? What I've worked with in the past? What I feel I've been the most successful in the past? For example, if, if you maybe at some point you worked at a, at a doctor's office, maybe as an assistant, um, you know, maybe the medical office field will be good for you, right? Because you have, you have a lot of contacts in that, in that field. Um, if you are more so, maybe you were, uh, a, I don't know, a chef or you worked in a restaurant in the past, uh, you know a lot of those vendors, you know how they, the restaurant work. Well, maybe the retail restaurant will be a good uh, place for you to uh, find a niche. Do you have any thoughts on, you know, small, uh, smaller um, residential combination commercial sure. versus versus just pure commercial? So I, I think it really depends on which route you want to ta take as an agent. Um, I, I find that if you are in the younger segment, right, maybe a, a little bit on the millennial side, even younger, uh, a lot of them because maybe they still have some financial support at home uh, or, or maybe they still have a part-time job, you know, going directly into commercial with a big brokerage might be an option. Um, and the reason why I say that is because when you go with these big brokerage companies, yes, they have some great, um, you know, uh, programs as far as getting you up to speed, teaching you the ropes, getting you on the, on, on the street and, you know, start selling. However, it's not cheap, right? Over there, the compensation plan, the commissions plans are totally different than the residential site. And that's mm -hmm. something that a lot of the agents uh, don't realize either, that you know, it, it, compensation and commissions are totally different on the residential from the commercial side. Now, so you have the other type of agent, maybe some residential agents, they have been in the business for some time. Uh, of course, they have family, they have kids, 
you know, they have a house to support, art to pay, bills to pay. You know, that particular agent cannot just all of a sudden quit the residential and go into commercial because, again, in commercial, you don't know when that paycheck is going to come in. It might take, you know, 90 days, 120 days. It could take six months before you get that paycheck. Because some deals, you know, take a little bit longer. So a lot of those uh, residential agents, um, the easiest way for them is be with a brokerage that it could be a residential brokerage for the most part, but they do have a commercial division. You can start transitioning into it. So that way you can still do your residential transactions while you are transitioning into the commercial. Um, I think most of our uh, viewers are residential agents and sure. um, with a residential slash commercial brokerage, um, there's also a way for them to maybe um, be involved without necessarily wanting to transition fully. Is that, right. is that accurate as well? I mean, yeah, sure. Definitely. Um, so what a lot of the uh, brokerages are uh, implementing, obviously the, the commercial division, of course, and of putting in place ways for you to uh, you know, get maybe shadow, maybe a commercial agent in there or have somebody that can coach you, mentor you on the commercial side and start teaching you the different, uh, you know, asset types or, you know, the, just the basic thing, commercial, how, how you can determine if there's a potential commercial deal in a residential transaction, right? So it, a really, really good example is you are, if you're a residential agent, you have a particular client you're working with, you're selling them a house, but somehow in the conversation, you know that maybe they're a business owner, a small business owner. Well, there's a potential conversation for commercial right there, right? What do you do? What do you love what you do? What type of uh, business do you do? You know, oh, and maybe you, at that point, you're like, you know what? I think there might be some potential commercial here. Let me talk to somebody that knows. And the, the residential uh, brokerage will put you in contact with that commercial division and say, hey, talk to this particular agent, maybe shadow this agent, or maybe partner up with them. You know, let's work on a referral basis. Or maybe talk to our coach or talk to our um, mentor. But can you just kind of touch on the way uh, real estate gets evaluated and um, and um, both from uh, an acquisition and a lender standpoint? Yeah, so so really in the commercial, it's more just about the numbers, right? It's, it's not like a residential, which is a lot of emotions involved, obviously, because you're talking, you know, family, where you're going to raise a family, where the kids are going to grow, right? So there's a lot of emotions involved in there, of course. Um, in the commercial world, it, it's more so about the numbers, right? Uh, so there is a business need, uh, maybe in the community, or there is a particular need for my type of business to grow it, to go in a certain area. Uh, it could be because maybe it's a opportunity zone, whatever it is, the need that you have. Um, the driven factors in here, obviously, is the numbers, right? Do the numbers work? At the end of the day, the, the numbers work. And I'm going to be able to service that debt. Uh, and it's the same way, that's what the lenders look for. Can you talk a little bit about the cap rates? And then I'll turn it over to Doug for uh, a couple of questions. Yeah, so the, so the cap rate, um, for many of you that don't understand, it's a, we call it the capitalization uh, rate, uh, which in the basic term, all it is is a measure of risk, right? So you have a percentage, and in theory, the higher that percentage, it's the higher the risk. People think, oh, the higher the, the percentage is you're making more money. Yeah, but in reality, in theory, it's because the higher the cap, there's a higher risk in there. Can you talk a little bit about due diligence on the commercial side? Yeah, so that is actually one of the most important aspects of a, of a commercial transaction. And this is this is one that uh, commercial agents or, or residential agents transitioning to commercial don't pay attention. And this is, this is one area that you should be paying the most attention because this, um, some people call it due diligence time, some other call it uh, the feasibility time frame because you have those feasibility studies in there. Um, this is where I think the most uh, deals make it or, or don't, right? And and also, it's really the approach that you give it to. Um, oftentimes, 
you will be required, and especially again, if you have some financing involved, um, let's say a environmental phase one, potentially phase two, are gonna be required by, by the lender or the bank or whoever is providing the money, uh, an engineering report as well. Um, so a phase one, and I'll break it down real quick, but a phase one is the most basic um, report on environmental report. So typically you'll hire a firm to start basically doing some research or start digging on this particular uh, property into the past, right? So, you know, it could be that this property today, I don't know, it looks like it's a restaurant today, but maybe 10 years ago was a gas station. Maybe 15 years ago was a, a car service station, right? So you have to go back into the past and you could start looking into EPA um, and, and their, their books, right? Uh, the files and see if somebody filed somebody in the past, you could start doing some history on, again, what was here before. Uh, and if you have a reasonable uh, doubt of, of maybe what, what happened here in the past, you can say, well, you know what, maybe 10 years ago, this was a gas station. I think it would be a good idea to do a phase one, right? Maybe phase one report, which is the very basics, found that, yes, in essence, there was a gas station maybe here 10 years ago. Nobody knew or maybe the neighbors knew, and that's how you start doing the research. Uh, at that point, the bank had said, you know what, maybe there's a, there's a higher risk component here. We're gonna order a phase two, which is a deeper research into it, right? Um, was, was there any problems on that site, right? Was there any leaks, any contaminations? Uh, was there any remediation, right? Was the problem taken care of? Uh, was there any money allocated to it? So it goes deeper and deeper and deeper. Now, that phase one or phase two, that can break a deal in a heartbeat. Same thing on the engineering um, uh, report, for example. And for the residential people, I want, I want them to understand that an, an engineering report, basically, it's like a inspection on steroids, right? So, so you're having a basic inspection of a property, um, but then there's a lot of other components you throw in there, right? Uh, not just the physical component in there, but also uh, the environmental component in there too. Um, if it is just dirt, is that dirt going to support the building, right? Or what's under that dirt? Uh, what type of maybe um, minerals are over here? Uh, is there is there water running through you know 20 feet down that we don't know about, right? It, it, I mean, there's so many so many things that can come in, in into this reports that. The only way the bank is going to find out, you're going to find out, is if you do a thorough uh, engineering report. You need to hire professionals, right? This is not your typical, uh, you know, residential inspector uh, type of thing. These are engineering firms. They they got the resources, they got the experience, they got the tools. Uh, they got to do a lot of digging uh, physically because there's a lot, you know, sometimes it's digging on the dirt, finding out what's in there but also digging through paperwork and, and finding, let's say, uh, deferred maintenance on the property, mm -hmm. what has been done in the past, uh, you know, what is the, what about suggestions uh, for maintenance in the future for this uh, property? Mm -hmm. how, how much is it gonna take? How long is it gonna take? And so the bank is gonna say, okay, do I want to lend money on this particular piece of property if it's gonna take this much to, to maintain going forward? What about a, maybe a, any, uh, you know, let's say EPA uh, violations or what about ADA violations, right? Uh, what about code violations? Um, you know, you, you don't want to buy a property that later on you find out that these properties got all kinds of violations and now you're stuck with them. You've got to fix them now. So now you're going to be spending a lot of money. And again, the bank wants to know all these things before they land on that asset just to, you know, and it's not that they're going to know 100% what happened with that asset, but they want to have a pretty good understanding of that asset and, and what's the value and what the future might hold for that particular asset. That's, it goes okay. in deeper, but that's the kind of basic. Let me jump in real quickly and just ask, you know, on a, uh, residential appraisal, the appraisal might start at four fifty five hundred and go up from there. And if it's a big home, it, it, it could approach a thousand dollars. 
uh, inspection reports are all over the place. You've got surveys. But when you start talking about commercial, just to give our audience an idea, where do commercial appraisals start? What's a phase one likely to start at, uh, you know, regardless yeah. of the, the, the property? I'm just, just trying to give people an idea yeah, sure. of, uh, of, uh, uh, of what this due diligence, not only costs in time and, and right. how it can impact the deal, but what, what costs are likely to be involved? And, and that's, that's a great question, Rich, because a lot of the agents think that, residential agents, right? They think it's just a, an inspection that's going to, you know, cost them three, four hundred dollars inspection, and uh, and maybe four or five hundred dollar, uh, you know, appraisal, and that's it. Well, it, it's not. <laughs> that's not the case in commercial, yeah. right? And, and commercial, somebody wants to go for a property. First of all, they are going to have to have a, uh, you know, quite a little bit of money in, in in, I'll say in the bank because they're going to spend money on survey if one hasn't been done. Survey, you know, I've seen it on the very, very lower end, probably starts at the twelve, fifteen hundred dollars, and they go up from there. Um, you know, a five acre with, you know, buildings and 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 pavement and whatever you have in there can run you four or five thousand dollars just on a survey, pretty easy, right? Uh, phase one environmental, on the cheaper side, I've seen them maybe somewhere in the twelve to fifteen hundred dollars to start mm -hmm. to begin with. And then go up from there, right? Mm -hmm. Then if you climb up into a phase two, you might be talking 10 grand. Who knows? Because on a phase two moving forward, maybe there's some soil tests that be need to be happening, you know, some boring, digging. That's time and money, right? Mm -hmm. Uh and and a lot of the agents and a lot of those clients don't understand that if you're the buyer, you're paying for all these things even before you think that there might be a deal. Right, you're you're spending all this money during your feasibility time or due diligence time, and you have no clue at this point if you actually are going to close on that property or not. You might spend five, ten, fifteen grand on this property that you will never own, mm -hmm. and and I think it's super important for agents to understand that that particular you know potential client they need to have some money allocated for this feasibility or due diligence time frames. Definitely. Back to uh, one of the things that you touched on in the uh, due diligence, you mentioned things like code, uh, code violations, and uh, one skill set that uh, differentiates commercial and residential is dealing with local municipalities. Yeah. You don't see that much on the residential, but it's uh, a component on the commercial side. Can you talk to that briefly? Yeah, it's super important for you to understand the basics uh, of, of what the uh the planning and zoning department of the of the different counties uh work and uh, what they look for um what are their plans as well I, I think it's more important to understand how is their future looking right let's say i give you an example for some of the people that uh, live on the north side of atlanta and maybe understand uh, or, or know these cities of like sugar hill swanee you know duluth uh, the, these are a Buford. These are cities that are actually gro uh, growing their their downtown components, right? Kind of creating sort of a downtown feel, but you know, with enough uh, you know interaction of, of businesses and the downtown components. So, and this is really to prevent people from driving all the way to Atlanta to have more of a downtown feel, right? Now, if you if you look at a lot of these. Uh, cities, if you are, you can actually go to their websites, the county or the city websites, and I think the first thing I would probably look for is uh, their master plan or, or comprehensive plans. What are they look at, looking to do for the next 5, 10, 20 years as a city, as a community? What do they want to invest in? Uh, you know, how do they want this community to look, you know, in terms of uh, aesthetics, right? Do they want them to, to have like an old town feel? bricks, you know, a lot of trees, parks for the for the for the families to interact, you know. And so if you go to the master plans, comprehensive plans, you'll understand what these cities and these counties are looking for. That's probably an easier way for you to know how to interact with them. Because again, if you look at these uh, master plans, comprehensive plans, uh, you'll understand what they're looking for in certain areas. 
that's going to cut a lot of time when you talk to a potential client that tells you, oh, I want to go into the Sugar Lake area and open my car dealership. Well, let me tell you something. It's not going to happen close to the city. Simple, right? In, instead of me wasting time, waste, wasting their time, a, a potential seller or buyer's time, I already know these answers. Why? Because I've been doing my research and knowing the basics of what these cities and these counties are looking for, right? Um, so again, it's super important that you know what, what stands they have in terms of changes and, and aesthetics. Uh, you know, some counties or some cities are more, um, I'll say, liberal, if you want to call it, or more open-minded, uh, more flexible. Uh, some cities are more conservative. Um, you know, let, let's say I live in uh, Forsyth County, and Forsyth County is a pretty fairly conservative county. Uh, you know, you, there are certain businesses that don't exist in Forsyth County because it's a fairly conservative county. Versus if you go to Fulton County or maybe Gwinnett County, some of those same businesses, yeah, they'll, you'll be able to open multiple ones up there. I don't want to be specific on, on a type of business, but, you know, again, try to find out if, if those cities or counties are either on the conservative side or on the more open-minded, you know, um, I guess, uh, side, if you want to call it, open-minded. I don't want to say liberal, but more open-minded. All right. Um, and, and probably attend some of those, uh, uh, you know, meetings, the planning and, and, and zoning board meetings, uh, attend over there, see what type of businesses are coming through or what's being proposed, uh, you know, who's looking to rezone what, what particular reason. You know, you should get involved, not only as an agent, but also as a citizen. Uh, uh, as a resident of that city or county, you should get involved. That's a way of, of you knowing what's happening in your neighborhood. What is the impact of COVID-19 going to be, you know, sort of short-term and long-term on commercial real estate uh, in general and maybe um, uh, in um, Metro Atlanta? I think, uh, I think commercial real estate is probably going to be uh, – the one's going to get hit the hardest, um, especially because of um, the financial dynamics that are involved in it, right? You, you're just not talking about a, you know, $200,000, $300,000 home that you can negotiate uh, some deferments or, you know, on your, on your mortgage or stuff like that. Yeah, those, those, uh, those lenders, you know, will negotiate sometimes too on, on, on the commercial side. But there's so many, so many components. Um, you know, you're you're talking from the asset to the business itself to to the um, all the resources, all all the vendors, to employees. I mean, there's so many moving parts. It's not just a house and a family that lives in a house, right? There's so many moving parts in a commercial transaction or commercial asset itself. And this is maybe going a little bit sideways. Um, but it said that in a residential transaction, when it closes, um, there's an impact somewhere around eighty to ninety thousand dollars on the local economy per every single transaction that it closes on a residential deal, and it's because you need to understand all the components, right? You have from, from the real estate agents, you have inspectors, you have appraisers, you have attorneys, um, you have other vendors involved, then you have you know, the moving, uh, any repairs, you know, you're going to Home Depot to spend money, right, or on Lowe's. There's a lot of components involved in every single transaction that when you look into the commercial world, that's tenfold. I mean, that is tenfold. Sergio, um, yes. any last thoughts on commercial real estate? Anything we haven't touched on that you think would be relevant for, for our viewers? Um, you know, there's... Uh, I think it's a very rewarding uh, field. Um, I think uh, there's definitely uh, some kind of a breed that works in the commercial environment. Not every agent it's made to work in the commercial world. You gotta have a stomach for it. Uh, and you have to have a, a deep pocket for it too because um, oftentimes you're gonna be working for many, many hours, for many, many months without getting a paycheck. Um, so you can think of it working on a commercial real estate just for the money, right? You gotta, you gotta think of it as, you know, 
am I part of a bigger thing in here? Am I part of a bigger chain, right? How am I uh, helping my community? How am I helping certain businesses, uh, the citizens of this particular area? Uh, maybe, you know, you're a big proponent of certain businesses or, uh, you know, and, and I think if you have a desire and, and you, you have a drive to, to change the world, and, and I, I'll say, you know, it's a cliche, change the world, but it starts by changing communities around you. I think getting involved in the commercial real estate is, is a great thing, way to do it. I appreciate our richer and Doc for the opportunity today. Um, if, if anybody that's listening have more questions about what we do uh, at Maximum One, I invite you to um, give us a call, um, you know, and, and confidential, uh, obviously. Uh, we can have a confidential phone call or, or, or meeting and talk a little bit more about a commercial. What is, what is the interest you in commercial? What we can assist you with or help you with. So let me, uh, let me wind up with some fun. Uh, let's wind up with some sure. fun here. Um, uh, we, are, uh, we have been in this pandemic. That's no fun, but uh, yes. people are finding new ways to have uh, a good time and uh, maybe some new, uh, new uh, games or apps or, or books. Anything you're doing to pass the time? Uh, anything interesting right now that so, you're doing for fun? Yeah, well, so... Um, maybe on the note, so much fun for people. I, I, I connect to certain websites to still know what's going on on a daily basis in the commercial world. One of those websites I like is uh, biznow.com. It's B-I-S-N-O-W.com. Uh, great website, uh, international website, but you have a Atlanta component. You can click in it and it tells you what's going on with the market. Right? On apps, uh, there's one app I like. Uh, that we use in commercial, it's called Landglide. Again, not affiliated with these people. I don't get a dime from them, obviously, but I think it's a great app. Um, on you know, it's it's a phone app. Um, you can download it, and uh, if you are sitting on a, on an asset in front of it, you can see the boundaries of it automatically, and you can see who the owner is. It has a link that that uh, access the um, the public. Uh, it could be the county or the state site. And gives you a little bit more information about that particular property. And what was that app again? What was that app? It's called Land Glide. Land Glide. I, I know that you're supporting you're supporting uh, local business. I, I yes. got that impression. Are you ordering? Uh, are you ordering delivery? And uh, uh, tell folks your favorite uh, restaurant right now for delivery, yeah. or a few favorite restaurants so they can uh, try something new that they haven't heard of. Uh, one of them I like, and I like it for two reasons. Uh, it's called Socks Love Barbecue. Uh, it's right off of exit 14 on 400 and coming, right across the street from um, the Honda dealership. Okay. Uh, Socks Love Barbecue, obviously for two reasons. I love their barbecue, great brisket. Um, but also, I love them more now because of what they did. So they started a local uh, movement in, in Cumming in Fortite County, and they took the social media and they started moving the masses into supporting other local businesses. Well, last one, again, on just a fun personal level, sure. what have been your best TV shows for binging, movies that <laughs> right. you've enjoyed? Um, what's your entertainment recommendation? So, binging, uh, I have a few on the Spanish side that I binge because I can watch it with my wife. Uh, but one that I recommend binging on, it's obviously Ozarks. Uh, Ozark because uh, mainly it's, it's a really interesting lot, lot of action, of course, in there. Uh, but also because it's, it's all filmed here in Georgia, right? Mm -hmm. And... Uh, they're also you know, using real estate for some very interesting purposes, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> very interesting purposes, very creative purposes. Uh, uh, there's a recent movie I watch. It's called Extraction. Um, I think it's called Chris Hemsworth. It's, it's the, um, the main character or the main guy in there. And uh, it's just a lot of action. It's about a, a kid that, that got kidnapped and he kind of rescues them or whatever. But just a lot of action in that movie. It's just to try to do something different. Thanks for taking some time out of your busy day to spend with us. Thank we you. are Richard Schaeferitz and Doug Dean from Schaeferitz and Dean.
And we've had the pleasure today of speaking with Sergio Ayala from Maximum One Executives uh, Real Estate and giving you a brief overview about commercial real estate. So thanks again for um, taking some time to spend with us in the virtual studio today. We appreciate your time and your insights. With that, thank you for participating in, a, in our Q&A today. Uh, have a great day with your commercial real estate and thanks for being part of our uh, video today. Thanks so much, Rich. And thanks so much, Thank Doc, you. for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, Sergio. Take care.